Our next speaker is Cynthia Rudin uh, from Duke, who I've been running into at the many workshops there have been on fairness, transparency, and accountability in machine learning. I think this is going to be one, of the, uh, one example of a talk in which, rather than just identifying the many problems that we're all discussing here, we start to look at technical solutions to some of those problems. So take it away, Cynthia. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, so first of all, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right, so last summer there was this article that came out that probably a lot of you read. This was the ProPublica article, and it was criticizing the Compass prediction tool for recidivism. Um, and in particular, it noted that the Compass prediction tool had some major issues with it, like it would rate people who, I don't know, you could, you could claim it was racially biased, it was gender biased, what, you know, there was a lot of problems with it. And the ProPublica article was, was analyzing it, um, and they were saying, Compass may still be biased, but we can't tell. And the company that makes Compass is called North Point. It says, North Point has refused to disclose the details of its proprietary algorithm, making it impossible to fully assess the extent to which it may be unfair. However, inadvertently, that's understandable. North Point needs to protect its bottom line. Excuse me. I do not care about North Point's bottom line. I care about the quality of our justice system. You know, and, and what's worse, you know, look, every time Compass is used, some money gets transferred from the government to North Point. Why is the government paying North Point for black box predictions? It, you know, it, it's not like this company has better machine learning tools than the rest of us, because I can guarantee you they don't. Um, you know, who trusted this company to make these kinds of sensitive decisions? Right, so I'm claiming we should put these guys out of business. Okay, so there should not be a business model for this. Okay, so anyway. What these guys are doing is very non-traditional. Right? The traditional way to do it is with a transparent model. And this is a model that uh, is called the Burgess model. It's from 1928. Uh, this is more like kind of the traditional types of transparent models. So you get a point based on your characteristics. Like if you're a mean citizen, you get a point. Or if you're a ne'er-do-well <laughs> or a farm boy. And then you add up the points, and the points translate into your risk of success or failure on parole. So that's an that's a old one, but there's more recent ones. So this is the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing score. Uh, you get points based on characteristics. Those points translate into a risk of being arrested. Okay, so that's a much, much more recent one. Same type of model, right? It's a linear model with integer coefficients. Why, why use this model? It's easy to use. It's easy to understand. Um, here's another one where uh, they are, uh, again, you add up the points, it translates into low, medium, or high risk of violence. Okay, so that kind of begs the question whether there's a principled way to create scoring systems, something that's transparent like the Burgess score, but also built on data like presumably the Compass system is. Okay, so well, we could have experts created and validated afterward, but that's what they've done since the 1920s. They just don't use data. Or we could do manual feature selection, and we could round the logistic regression coefficients afterward. But this is really a hack. Because when you round in a high dimensional space, you're, you're moving, you, you could really mess things up. You're moving a, lot, a little bit in a lot of different dimensions. So for instance, if you have a lot of very small coefficients and you put them all to zero, you, you're really messing up your whole signal there. And so that's, that's clearly a bad idea. And maybe we should actually solve it and you could say, well, this is computationally hard. Well, come on, you know, it's not like we're afraid of computers here. I mean, we've got to solve this problem, right? This is, there's no excuse for not trying to solve it. This is a, is a real benefit to society if we can actually do it. OK, so the starting point to doing this is um, called SLIM, which is super sparse linear integer models. And what SLIM does is it, it, uh, it tries to make the model as accurate as possible but also keep the model very sparse, meaning a small number of, of uh, terms. And um, the tr the, all of the, the points have to be integers, small integers between negative 10 and 10, say, or you could put in whatever you wanted. And the coefficients have to be co-prime. So when I say co-prime, I mean that if the point scores come out 2, 2, 4, 2, and 6, then we sh it should be reduced to 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3. OK? No, no, uh, no prime factor in common to all these terms. OK, so SLIM has a bunch of major advantages. Um, so for instance, I could answer this question, right? How, many, how much training accuracy do I sacrifice 
to get one fewer term in the model. Now you can't really, you can't really answer this question for logistic regression or support vector machines or random forests or neural networks or whatever. But for this method you can, it's exactly C0. Okay, whatever number you put in for this trade-off parameter here. So if C1, if C0 is 0.01, then you sacrifice 1% training accuracy to get one fewer term in the model. Okay, so how much training accuracy do I trade off to get the coefficients to be co-prime? And the answer is provably none, because as long as this epsilon is below a specific threshold, then you will sacrifice provably no training accuracy to get co-primes. Could there be a sparser model with equivalent training accuracy? And the answer is, um, if you solve this to optimality, provably not. Okay, so maybe you're a doctor and you want to know if, I, if you could get a model that's optimal for a specific sensitivity, specificity, true positive, false positive trade-off. And the answer is simply yes. You just place a constraint that says false positives not more than a certain amount, and then you solve it. Okay, so what about trying, so everybody, you know, the, the statisticians like to use their traditional methods, so maybe you could just use lasso and then round all the coefficients. Um, but actually, it turns out that this can fail very badly, and in particular, in the regime, particularly in the regime where the models are very sparse and interpretable, that's exactly where lasso performs badly. Okay, so this is the, it turns into a mathematical program, and this is the notation for that mathematical program. And you put it into, there's a there's solver specifically designed for mixed integer programs. And uh, uh, the code is publicly available, so you don't have to do it yourself, you can just use our code. And what I'm going to show you are some results on uh, a data set that is a, it's the largest publicly available data set on recidivism prediction that I know of. It's got 33,796 prisoners, and they followed them for three years after they were released. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve several prediction problems using SLIM, but using also a whole bunch of other machine learning techniques, and we're going to see what the accuracy looks like. Okay, so we're trying, these, these are the prediction problems. We'll try to predict arrest within three years of being released. An arrest for what type of crime? Was it a drug crime, a violent crime, domestic violence, sexual violence, or fatal violence? And we had variables about, we had the whole criminal history of all these people. We had um, gender, age, and all kinds of other stuff. Alcohol abuse, that stuff. Okay, so what I'm showing you here are ROC curves. So this is the false positive rate here and the true positive rate, and you want to be up here. And over here, I've listed a whole bunch of different machine learning algorithms. And what you'll notice is that all of these curves are basically on top of each other, okay? So what that means is that there's very little difference in predictive, you know, predictive accuracy, essentially, predictive quality. Doesn't matter which method you use, okay? So slim is the blue one, and the green one, which is a little bit funny, this is a decision tree method called CART, and CART very often performs badly. Okay, but, but the, the slim and these decision tree models down here, those are the ones that are known to be interpretable. Okay, so here again, this is for, that was for arrest, this is for predicting general violence, and again, the decision trees perform badly, that's kind of standard, especially when the, the problem is very imbalanced. And slim is, again, these blue dots here. And the rest of the methods are all performing the same. This is sexual violence and, and fatal violence. Uh, I guess I skipped that one, but it's the same thing. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that each blue dot here is a slim model. It's actually a scoring system. So because they're interpretable, I can put them on a slide. You don't have to pay for them to get the, <laughs> get the predictions. So this is actually... This dot corresponds to this model that predicts arrest within three years. Okay, and you can see that it, it looks at, you know, your age at release, the number of prior arrests, if you've had a prior arrest for misdemeanor, and if you're above 40. And you add up all the points, and if the point's above one, we predict that you'll be arrested within three years. Okay? And then it has a, a kind of interesting logical um, interpretation. If you're looking at this carefully, you probably are trying to derive this in your head right now. Um, so it's, it's essentially predict arrest if 
the age at release is 18 to 24 years old, or you've had a lot of prior arrests and you're below age 40, or you've had a lot of prior arrests, you're above age 40, and you've committed a misdemeanor. Okay? Okay, let me, let me keep going here. Okay, so here's, uh, here's another couple of models that I just grabbed. These are also blue dots on these curves. So this model is predicting domestic violence. Um, this is general violence. Sexual violence and fatal violence. And all the models pretty much look like that. Okay? So definitely possible to construct these scoring systems. And then let's, let's talk about a different problem, which is risk assessment. So what I just showed you were decision-making models. So let me tell you the difference between a decision-making model and a risk assessment model. So with a decision-making model, you, you would sort of add up all the points and then it predict something if, the, if it was above, the score was above a threshold. But with the risk assessment models, you add up all the points and it translates into a risk. Okay? So, um, so just very different types of problems, so it requires different math. Okay, so um, this is the math for the risk assessment tool. It's called Risk Calibrated Slim. And it uses a combination of, of the logistic loss, which gives you the, the probabilistic interpretation. You can get conditional probabilities. And then also it tries to make the model size small. And then we, again, we have to stick to small integer coefficients so that it can look like a, a point score. But now we have a mixed integer nonlinear program. And so these things are almost impossible to solve unless you have, you know, even for small problems, these things are almost impossible to solve unless you have a specialized optimization technique. Okay, so we've been developing these specialized cutting plane methods that, um, that really use the structure of this problem. Okay, and so cutting plane methods, they're great in that they scale to almost arbitrarily large sample sizes, um, essentially for free. And the reason for this is because of the, that at each iteration, you, you, you create a lower bound to the, so, so if the objective looks like this, you create a lower bound to the objective using your data. And these are called cuts. And so you, you create these things at every iteration of this thing. And then, um, then you form an optimization problem comprised only of the cuts. And that's a linear program. And so it doesn't, that, that linear program doesn't use the data at all. Okay. So you alternate between computing cuts using the data, so you can parallelize all that stuff, and then you solve the linear program just using the cuts that you have. Okay, so um, this is one of the risk slim models for arrest, again, and it happily uses just plus one and minus one as its coefficients. All right, so um, the work that I just presented was joint with um, my, my PhD student, student, Burke Ustin, and my former undergraduate, Jiming Zhang. And I'm going to switch topics now, and I'm going to talk about a different type of interpretable model. And this work is done with Aline Angelino, Daniel Alabi, Nicholas Lara Stone, and Margot Seltzer. Okay, so our, our goal was to, I don't know if you remember, but in the in this couple of slides ago, I was saying that the decision tree models like CART, they don't perform very well. So this is an alternative to CART. Okay, we, we're trying to produce logical models, uh, which are also called rule lists or decision lists. And these are if-then type models. Okay, so the, the models say things like, you know, if some conditions are met, then predict something or other. Else if some other conditions are met, then predict something or other. Else if, and then so on. And then if none of the conditions are met, you predict something. Okay, so it's a, a series of of if-then rules, and to classify a new observation, the first rule it satisfies is the one that classifies it. So for instance, if you are 18 to 20 years old, you get, you, your predictions are made by that very top rule, okay? Not by any of the ones below it, even though you may satisfy those. Okay, so the nice thing about these models is that they're interpretable <coughs> to human experts because they follow logical conditions, okay? But, uh, they're computationally hard to compute from data in the worst case. Now, constructing these things optimally is a very famous, very old problem. It's called the optimal decision tree problem, um, although uh, we're going to take a, a bit of a different take on the optimal decision tree problem. And I've been working on this problem for years, and we've made several breakthroughs on this, 
And I want to tell you about some results that just came in on Friday. So unpublished, completely, completely new. OK, so this, we don't even have a name for it. <laughs> and uh, this method, it, it tries to, well, it doesn't minimize accuracy. It, it minimizes error plus some constant times the number of rules. And it uses a customized branch and bound search. So this is kind of like the alpha beta pruning that was discussed earlier today. It, it lops off giant chunks of the search space um, at every iteration. OK, so it, it mine, the, it, it's constructed from the bottom up. Usually decision trees are constructed from the top down, but this one's constructed from the bottom up. So it, it mines high frequency item sets and assembles this list out of these item sets. It figures out what the conditions are that goes, go into the rule list and puts them there in the right order. OK, so for instance, here with this rule list, um, the rule mining algorithm would have uh, would have found that you know there are there are a significant number of people with ages 18 to 20, so that would have been a frequent item set that it would have picked out. Okay, so all of these in boxes, those would have been frequent item sets that would have been in our giant pile that we would have chosen and assembled into this rule list. Okay, and. Uh, my collaborators are database experts, so they really know how to make calculations go really fast. Uh, we're using very fast bit vector calculations and very careful data structures. And the knowledge of symmetry for rule lists. Um, so in, in particular, the fact that we're working with permutations of rules, it means that um, you know, we need only to work with the optimal permutation at all times. And the rest, you can just throw it out. And then there's a whole bunch of theorems that just literally lop off big chunks of the search space. And, and the algorithm actually proves that you know at, at the end of this, so it, after it removes all these inaccurate prefixes or non-interpretable prefixes, just removes everything. And then what you're left with is it, the algorithm is actually proving that no rule list exists that has a better value of the objective than the one it found. It actually has a, a, um, a certificate of optimality. OK, so let's go back to the compass score. Now, ProPublica, they calculated that on their recidivism data set, the compass accuracy was 65.37%. And I got that, this, this confusion matrix from their article, and I calculated that rate. Now, that begs the question, does, does an interpretable model with that accuracy exist? So 65.37. Um, because if it does, then it begs the question of why North Point is allowed to stay in business. So, um, and ProPublica made their data set public so we could actually test for it. So we ran our algorithm on the ProPublica data set. We did standard tenfold cross-validation and all that, and we produced this plot. Okay, so let me tell you what this plot means. So this is time in seconds. This is on the order of 10 to the third seconds on a single machine. Uh, and this thing is the test, uh, sorry, the training error of the algorithm, which is around 30 some percent. The test accuracy from the tenfold cross validation was 67%, 67.5%, so significantly more accurate than the compass tool on that ProPublica data set. And the blue curve over here is the value of the objective that we're trying to minimize, which is that combination of error rate and number of terms. And then the most interesting thing is this green curve, which is, which is a lower bound on the value of the objective. So the fact that this green curve and this blue curve meet is a certificate of optimality. We've actually proven that we've gotten the optimal model here and no better uh, model exists with a better balance of accuracy and interpretability. And um, OK, so these are the interpretable models we get. They fit on an index card. They're more accurate than Compass on the ProPublica data set. They're provably optimal. They're among the best models that have particular balance of, of accuracy and sparsity in our model class. Now, none of our risk assessment scores, um, well, OK. so. Yeah, this is a, this is a quote from, from Brennan, who was the North Point founder. And he said that it's difficult to construct a score 
that doesn't include items that can be correlated with race, things like poverty, joblessness, and social marginalization. And he says that if you omit those from your risk assessment, accuracy goes down. And I just want to make a point that none of our risk assessment scores with the ProPublica data set, with the recidivism, other recidivism data set, um, none of them relied on race or other very obvious socioeconomic factors, right? only criminal history. So as far as my collaborators and I can tell, um, the, data, the data, at least the data that we have, ac that we have access to, um, says that Brennan is not correct. All right, so I, before I go, I, I wanted to tell you briefly about a project with Hima Lakaraju that just got accepted to AI stats last week. So, and, and this is related to rule lists. And we were hoping for a model that doesn't, do, doesn't just do predictions, but also tells you end to end how to treat a medical patient. So what tests to take and in what order and what treatment to prescribe. And the full model should take into account the cost of everything you're going to do, like pretending you're the doctor. Okay, so the, the model should be causal. In other words, it's got to include um, counterfactual inference because it's going to be prescriptive. It's going to tell you what to do. So you have to know what would happen to each patient if they were given every possible treatment. And then we, we have to include the cost of gathering information, like medical testing. We've got to include the cost of treatment, so the cost of drugs and possible side effects, and the cost of actually making a wrong decision. And then this model should give a prescription of how to, to test and treat each patient. And this is an example of that, the result of that, um, the result of this algorithm on a bail data set of about 60 or 86,000 individuals. And um, so Hema knew, she knew that certain kinds of information were more private than others. So for instance, here, like if their, their marital status, whether they pay rent, number of addresses in the past year, she was assuming this was more difficult information to obtain than stuff that was in their record, like age and prior arrest and so on. Um, so she placed a higher cost on that. And then she also had different costs on um, releasing someone on personal, um, on personal recognizance or re releasing someone on condition. So if you release them on personal recognizance, it means you think they're going to come back and not commit a crime while they're out on bail. And if they're unconditioned, it's more expensive, but it prevents them from, from doing that. OK, so the model says, if you're female and your current charge is minor and you have no previous offenses, then you should be released on personal recognizance. If, if this doesn't apply, then if you've had previous offenses and you've had a prior arrest, then you should be released on condition. Um, else, if, you, if your current charge is a misdemeanor charge and you're less than 30, then you should be released on condition. Else, if your age is greater than 50 and you've had no prior arrest, then you can be released on personal recogn recogn reconnaissance. And then, um, then we get into these more expensive conditions. Now you've got to check if they're single and they pay rent. And if their current charge is misdemeanor, then you release them on condition. Else, if they've had at least five addresses in the past year, you, you know, release them on condition. Otherwise, you can release them on per personal recognizance. Okay, so um, while I'm concluding, I decided to let you stare at Burke's um, new ADHD scoring system and see whether you think you have ADHD while I, while I close. So just to summarize, <laughs> um, we can build scoring systems and logical models directly from data. And these lead to hard computational problems. But um, you know, if, you're, if you're clever about how you use that computation, then um, you can get models with a provable guarantee of optimality. And that's true for most data sets that are like um, you know, criminal recidivism or, or, or medicine. Um, uh, I also work on energy, so we have data sets also from that domain. And the, the, thing, you know, the thing about an interpretable model is that it may not be perfect, right? but at least you can figure out why. Like you can criticize all the models that I put up and you could say, they're not fair, they don't include think factors that I don't want, and blah, blah, blah. But at least you can see what it's doing. So that's the thing that's nice about it. And if there's an issue with the data, then hopefully you will actually get to know about it by looking at the model. OK, thanks. <laughs>